These are the unforgiving streets of East Los Angeles, California. Here we go. To some, they represent hope and a way out. To others, they are a dead end of gang violence that has victimized far too many. In the community that I grew up in, you were either dead, a teenage mom, on drugs, or in jail. So it would pick whatever you wanted. Angela is the big sister of the Diaz family. They grew up on these streets and still live here. Back then, David was the man of the house, all raised by a single mom. One of the first. Today, they are a tight sisterhood, a mother, a wife, a sibling, determined after all these years to win freedom for David. As I'm looking at these pictures, he always had a nice smile. It hasn't been easy. I've gone back to the scene many times to see it was blocks from where we lived, several blocks actually. So it wasn't something that we would go just walk down and it wasn't something that we would do. Familiar or not, this intersection would become a crime scene the night of July 14th, 1998. And 19-year-old David Diaz would pay the price. The crime that put David Diaz behind bars happened right here the corner of Manitou and Griffin, a nondescript intersection in Los Angeles' Lincoln Heights neighborhood. Police say six shots were fired that night, three of them into the leg of the victim, Remberto Preciado. He didn't die that night, but some say justice did. Well, I firmly believe that David is innocent. Attorney Adam Grant runs Loyola Law School's Project for the Innocent. He's an expert on wrongful convictions. How many cases are you working on? He believes David Diaz is in prison for a crime he didn't commit. In David's case, with no physical evidence and people halfway recanting on the stand, it seems like one of those cases where the prosecution got them so fired up about the possibility of, of these people being in street gangs that it was very easy to get a conviction. And in this case, it was just simply wrong. There are, in fact, two very different versions of what happened that warm summer night. For David Diaz, those two stories have meant the difference between freedom and life behind bars for the past 20 years. In the summer of 1998, Lethal Weapon 4 opened number one at the box office. According to David Diaz, this was the only gunfire he was close to, the Hollywood version. Spending the evening of July 14th with his family at the Edwards Theater in Alhambra, California. It was one of the ones that we all had wanted to see. So it was a hot movie, everyone wanted to see it, and you know we were excited. But according to police and the version of the story that put Diaz behind bars, David was the shooter. They say he was picked up by two friends in a gray car. And when they came upon rival gang members at this corner, that's when they say Diaz got out of the car, confronted them, and opened fire. Uh, I got this bad feeling, so I look and I, I see this guy coming up to me with a gun. But now TYT is hearing from the victim himself. He just asked me where I was from, and I told him where I was from, and I started talking shit to them, and makes you know I'm getting hit. <laughs> Rimberto Preciado called us from California's Salinas Valley State Prison, where he's serving time on an unrelated case. It was not him. I was there face to face with the person that shot me, you know, and it was not him. It's very persuasive that the victim is, um, has said that David is not the person who shot him. I can think of motives that a clever prosecutor would attribute to him for doing that besides just being honest. The Diaz case is seemingly ripped from the headlines of the 1990s, where gang violence overwhelmed Los Angeles and cops tried to fight back, at times unfairly. 
I feel that they were just out to get him. People were just frightened of gang members and people they perceived to be gang members. And it's remarkable to me in some of these cases how little evidence it was necessary to prove or to bring to get a conviction. In David's case, there's no physical evidence tying him to the crime. No gun was ever found, no fingerprints left behind. All witnesses have since recanted any previous testimony. In written statements, the driver of the car, Kung Fu, and his passenger, Jenny Vaca, submitted these signed statements swearing police forced them to frame Diaz. The victim's then-girlfriend, Martha Sierra, goes even further. In her statement, she claims she rushed to the L.A. County USC Medical Center, thinking Rimberto was badly injured. But she claims police refused to let her see him until she identified the shooter. She told the story to Angela Diaz. She said, they gave me a book. I turned a couple of pages and I said, him. I circled it and I put my name on it. I never thought of anything else. She says, I just wanted to go see my boyfriend before he died. When I saw your brother in the court, I knew that wasn't the guy who did it. And I said, oh my fucking God. The LAPD had no comment for TYT, but for David Diaz, 20 years have taken their toll. He entered prison at 19. He's 39 years old now. Diaz called us from California's Pleasant Valley State Prison. This is my story. It could happen to anybody. It happened to me, and I really feel that um, now that my case is being told more and, and people are talking about it, I have belief and faith on um, something's going to be done about it now. Diaz gets his strength from the strong family that supports his fight. Lydia and David grew up as friends. He's not okay. David's not okay, and I, I seen my friend, and, and I know him from when we were children, and I remember him playing and laughing, and, and, and David was just this witty, smart guy who always wanted to play chess, and, and now they dehumanized him, and I, 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 I drove home crying, and I said, what can I do? What can I do? God, what can I do? Friendship soon turned into much more. They became husband and wife in April of 2018. I started falling in love with him. And he asked me one day, he said, Lydia, he said, would you marry me? We just all started crying. Everybody was in tears. And it was such an emotional wedding for me. Lydia started a petition for David on change.org. Expecting a few hundred signatures, she was shocked when they reached 55,000. She knew it was time to act. In June of 2018, Lydia and David's mom, Yolanda, flew to Sacramento to deliver a commutation petition to California Governor Jerry Brown. The victim's mother came with them. It's a rare occasion where all the mother, the wife, and the victim's mother are telling Governor Brown, release him, let him go, he's innocent. For Yolanda Diaz, there is no way to replace the years but she remains closely connected to her son and her faith. For my birthdays, for Christmas, for Valentine's, for Mother's Day, he doesn't buy a card, he draws me cards and he writes inside of them. And he would tell me every year, I'm sorry, Mom. Every year, again, I'm not with you. Years have been rough for me. I know I can never get those years back, but for the most part, um, I, I feel blessed with the people God has put in my life. The system that put somebody in prison in the first place is an enormous system with enormous power, and they consider a conviction final. It's a huge wall to climb over, really, because the whole system is about finality. And once somebody's been convicted, they're not really looking for a chance to believe them or overturn their conviction. Yolanda Diaz is ill now and doesn't know how long she can fight, but prays for time and strength. I tell God, don't take me yet to heaven. 
bring my son home and then if you want to take me you can take me but bring him home